No, I was starting with good morning again because I greeted most of you as you came in and had a little time during the fellowship. But um, what's important is to just get your attention and draw you into the message that God has placed on my heart. And that's what I try to share. We work so hard at pulling together a worship service that all meshes together with the, the music, the altar, the uh, every setting that is here so that it tells you the story that God is trying to get through us to you for each week. The message this morning we entitled, as I have already said to you, um, I'm your mentor. Let me lead you. Now don't allow that to be mistaken. My intention is for Jesus to say this to you, not me to say this to you. However, I have been told those of uh, who have accepted their calling are held to a different standard. So my leadership and God's leadership must be the same for you to follow in the direction of God's calling for your life. With those things said, and understanding that it's the message that we receive from God that's important. I want to start this morning, different than normal, I want to start this morning by reading Matthew 16, 21 through 28. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Now, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord! This shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, they must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever wants to lose their life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and that forfeits his soul? Or what can you give in exchange for your soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. I tell you the truth. Some are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in His glory. It is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Let me tell you something that has always, with this passage, every time I read it, became a distraction to me. Have you ever had a passage do that to you? Let me tell you why. I get to the part when I'm reading along and I know Peter's heart, I think. I know that Peter's impetuous. I know. And he's trying to do what's earthly right. He hears Jesus tell them of his faith journey, his spiritual journey, his Messiah mission. And Peter goes, no, I'm not going to let that happen to you. I'm going to, in, I'm going to step in between you and them and protect you. And I get this, and I'm okay so far. And then Jesus wheels around, points his finger in Peter's face, and he says, get behind me, Satan. And this is Peter the Rock. And that's where I just get off the train and go, I can't believe you just said that. I can't believe you called Peter Satan. 
Now, in my word processor, it continually is a little bit like my, like my GPS. If you set your GPS to go home and you turn on a side road to go somewhere else, what does your GPS do? It keeps telling you, turn around. You miss the turn, go back. I, I get to this point in my life and I'm just flabbergasted with what Jesus said. It happened to me again. I'm trying to be prepared. Actually, I told Sharon, I, I get distracted when I hear Jesus talk like that. So I went to the commentaries. I went online. I went everywhere that I have respected scholars to help me understand what was going on. And here's the difference between what I told you I read and what I read. Jesus was calling down Satan's takeover of Peter's earthly desire to help. I never read it that way before. I never read it that Peter had allowed himself to interfere, to distract, in our words for today, to distract Jesus from the direction that God had called him to go. Jesus' journey and Jesus' focus was on God's will. And Peter was trying to intercede in an earthly way. And Jesus did God's will. Take that scene. Now let me read it to you from the message. Yes, it's poetic. Yes, it's a, a, a translation that is, that, that is different. But see if it doesn't make a difference in the way your heart and your mind hear the same words. It's entitled. I love the title. I'm a title guy. I'm a wordsmith. You're not in the driver's seat. And then Jesus made it clear to his disciples that it was now necessary for him to go to Jerusalem, submit to an ordeal of suffering at the hands of the religious leaders, be killed, and then on the third day be raised up alive. I get it. Peter took him in hand, protesting, impossible master. That can never be. But Jesus did not swerve. Peter, get out of my way. Satan, get lost. You have no idea how God works. And then Jesus went to, the, to work on his disciples. Anyone who intends to come with me has to lead, uh, let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way. To finding yourself your true self. What kind of a deal is it to get everything you want but lose yourself? What did you ever trade for your soul? Don't be in such a hurry to go into business for yourself before you know the Son of Man will arrive with all splendor of his Father, accompanied by an army of angels. You'll get everything you have coming to you a personal gift. This isn't pie in the sky by and by and by. Some of you standing here are going to see it take place. See the Son of Man in kingdom glory. I have a library that is uh, maybe 10,000 books. I have one section devoted to Bibles. Some of them I can't even read because they're in German. But I have every translation that I have ever come in contact with. And it helps sometimes to look at a reference point that is closer to the way I think. Which hopefully gets closer to the way God thinks. So I was reading in my commentary for Matthew. It's written by a guy named Dr. Michael J. Wilkins. He's the Dean of Talbot School of Theology at uh, Biola University. For those of you that are native to this coast that's in California, Southern California. And um, 
this author has a way of putting things that are just pretty down to earth, and he's an avid surfer. So he rang my bell in several, di several different ways. When I worked for Rockwell International before ministry, we lived in Southern California. Now, he says his part of Southern California was the ideal place to live. We lived in Capistrano Beach, and it was the ideal place to live. Well, at least Candy thought that. And the temperature was always good. I had a two-hour drive each way every day. Candy didn't. Um, but this is where we lived, right near San Clemente, uh, Dana Point, and all the world <coughs> surfers came in the off-season to San Clemente to practice surfing, and that's where our children grew up. And that's where K2 learned to surf from the world surfer. And so I touched base with all the things that Dr. Michael was uh, writing about, Southern California, avid surfing. And he told this story that makes a lot of sense to me. I hope it makes sense to you. He said, as he looked out of his window and saw the Pacific Ocean, the places that he liked to surf were just there. And there was one that was really close to him, like right here. And it had a reef that had formed in kind of an arrow. And it would make the most perfect waves you have ever experienced in your life, whether you're a surfer or you just like seascapes. And the waves were absolutely gorgeous, but he didn't surf there. Because you see, those perfect waves only came once or twice a year. So he surfed over here. It wasn't that much further, and the waves were not that good, but they were consistent. And he became a better surfer by surfing consistent waves than waiting once or twice a year to get the perfect ride. You see, that makes sense to me. And even if you're not a surfer, you can kind of get your arms around what he's talking about is consistency of following Jesus. It's so easy to, to pull those two comparisons together. What good is it for you to take that little card this morning and for your one time a year tell somebody about Jesus? I just had a flash. Um, several times in my ministry, I have been given what is called, um, what I call, minute ministry. Uh, I was a chaplain as part of my training in, in the beginning. And I was assigned, as some of you know, to the uh, bird center in Tampa General and the um, oncology children uh, department all of which were on the little card and when I drew them I'd already said God don't send me to either of these two places because that's not where I need to be and God goes oh yeah kiss you now the oncology pediatrics is where all of the babies are with cancer. And they're in little beds that look like cages, and they look like little monkeys, and they're holding on to the bars. And because, you see, most of the parents had to work. And they were there from all over the world, and some of them, their parents, couldn't even be there. Well, often, it's like once or twice a year where the waves are good. And it broke my heart to go in there and pray with children that I thought, they don't even know how to speak and how are they hearing what I'm saying as I'm praying for their tiny bodies. On the other side, the burn victims, it was, I can't remember what they call it, class four, class three, something trauma center for burn victims. And they send people from all over the United States because it's so well equipped and they're so knowledgeable. It's the only place I've ever been thrown out of. Oh no, McDonald's when we open the salt containers and let them. Never mind. Um, it's the only place that I've legitimately been thrown out of a room when I tried to pray with a person who was a burn victim and he threw a Bible that I'd left and hit me in the back of the head with it as I was leaving the room. And as I was leaving, I was saying something like, oh yes, okay, Buster. I went back the next morning to see if I could reconcile with him and he had died. What I learned was is there's a time in, in, in healing 
especially for burn victims, where they get this, I'm going to get better, and that's moments before they're going to get better or worse, depending on their lifestyle. And I called that minute ministry because I only had a minute with them because the next day they may be gone. And for me, I relish the opportunity to be in ministry to my family, to my friends, to those who constantly come and share the good and the bad of their life. And, and I constantly try to be a mentor to share with you the way God has called me to live. It's about consistency. And for me, this setting works much more than the other. Peter and the other disciples needed consistency in their discipleship journey to Christ. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Here's why I stood out there in the morning and this morning and asked you about the distractions that come in between you and, and God. In our journey, in their journey, they needed to decide, am I going to follow Christ or am I going to live in this world and worry about the things that try to take me away from that? And it's whether you stub your toe, break your leg, lose, lose someone important to you, or are diagnosed with something terrible. You see, those are distractions. Those are things that keep you from consistently loving and following Jesus. And that's one thing that Jesus never did. Jesus never let worldly situations, worldly circumstances, divert him from doing what God called him to do. So here's one more plea for the Apostle Peter. I'm asking you to think hard before you, you judge the impulsive guy. I can kind of relate to Peter many times. Because that impulsiveness that becomes who Peter is over the centuries. We judge him as a fault. I know that you and certainly I respond quickly to awkward situations. Peter's successes and failures become significant learning opportunities for you and I because we start to relate to the humanness of who Peter was. And in that, it led him to greatness as he understood if you get rid of the distractions in life and focus like Christ did on where God's will is taking you. It becomes an unswerving commitment to follow not only the Jesus of the Bible, but the lifestyle that Jesus laid down for us to understand. It's, there's a significant difference between Christian martyrdom that history leads us to understand and the, and the way that Christ died. Let me tell you the difference. The, the difference, for, let's take Stephen, Stephen martyr for example. His death was a consequence of his conviction. He was a believer, and that belief made him firm and strong, and that con conviction cost him his life. Jesus was different. And Jesus following the will of God was his entry into history. Before you judge that statement, let me say it this way. Jesus came to fulfill prophecy. It's who he was. It's what he did. His true identity was based on messianic mission, which is God's will and way beyond an earthly mission. Think about that. Think about what people thought Jesus should do. Mount up your horse, bring your soldiers, take over Rome. Messianic mission is so different than what the people wanted Jesus to do in their own little peanut minds of what God wants for us. 
So how does all of this affect our lives? That's really what we're here for. That's what we need to understand. That's how we become closer. That's how we find the perfect way in the consistent waves down the beach. This reveals the one central principle of discipleship. We must have an unswerving goal to never let distractions keep us from accomplishing God's will. That's really hard, but really easy. It becomes our cross to bear. That's why Jesus chose the cross as a way of death. And it became the icon of our belief. The empty cross became our icon. Nothing, no personal hardships, nor life's cruel fate shall interfere or deter God's will. And it is urgent for us to understand this concept of being a believer. Because every day you wake up, you know, I kind of wiggle my toes and bend my knees that crackle and pop and wake candy up like an alarm. Every day that's the routine that I'm in. Every day is the possibility of impending reward or judgment, depending on your consequences. I've got one little story to tell you before we wrap this up, and it might help. You all remember that legendary broadcaster, Paul Harvey. Yes. I can't, I tried last night to think of this. And the rest of the story. Thank you. Couldn't think of that to save me. I think my soul's already saved. He told the story about uh, Ray Blankenship. It caught my eye because I knew of Ray Blankenship. I'm sure it wasn't the same one. But Ray Blankenship was sitting there in the morning just before he got ready to start his routine. And he had a little bowl of cereal. And he's sitting there in his little uh, breakfast nook. And he could, he could see the, out the window in the, the front yard and how things were going. And guess what? It's raining cats and dogs. That's appropriate for now, right? It's just raining cats and dogs, and the rain is collecting, and it's starting to overflow the the, um, the, the, the it's starting to overflow in the um, ditch, the ditch in front of his house, and then the water keeps get, getting higher and the faster, and it's going down the, down the street. And while he's sitting there having his cup of coffee, he notices a little child on her way to school, and and the next thing. It, it, almost made his heart stop because the little girl stumbled and fell into the ditch. And she was tiny and rain gear and umbrellas and school books and backpacks and, and she is tumbling down this ever-growing stream of current that is beyond her ability to get out. And he just dropped everything. He ran out just as he was, ran out down the steps, and he's running along as the little girl is tumbling in the water, gasping for air and trying to reach it. And he jumps in to the stream of water that's growing and getting stronger and stronger. He grabs the little girl by the arm, and they're both being carried down the ditch towards the culvert, which would take them both underneath the street into the sewer system. And just three feet before the culvert, his hand on the bank finds a rock that's protruding. And he holds on for dear life. And he's praying, Lord, let me cling to this until someone comes that can help us. Ray did better than that. He was able to manage to grab the, the little girl and pull them, both of them, out of the raging waters, and they were both okay. They were checked out, but they were both okay. Because when the EMS and the paramedics arrived, they were sitting on the bank, exhausted, and wondering about their ordeal. This happened in 1989, and he was awarded one of the meritorious awards for a civilian. It's the U.S. Coast Guard Silver Life-Saving Medal. Uh, well, did I mention that Ray does not swim? Ray could not swim. But he became a mentor for us to follow. 
So the question is, which are you seeking? What is the call you are following in your discipleship journey? Some time ago there was a book written called The Comfortable Pew, and I, I worry that many people are seeking that seat. Not only here in, in churches around the world, but in life. Here's one for you. Have you ever heard anyone say, sure, I'd love to follow Jesus? Many have said that before they under, understand that there are two qualifications. First is called self-denial. And second is called take up your cross. And the truth is that we can't do the first until we've done both of them at the same time. You can't follow Jesus without denying yourself and taking up your cross. It's a little bit like claiming to be a Gator fan but not willing to wear the t-shirt. Here's one that might make more sense. That you would be a Packer fan and unwilling to wear that thing that the cheese head, isn't it? The one that's related to the Packer. They could call them cheese heads. You see, sisters and brothers, Jesus knows without the commitment, without the sacrifice, we will slide backward and fade into the darkness. Maybe we desire our own theology to follow. Maybe we desire to be in leadership over fellow followership. The problem with this philosophy is that when we rebel or wander away from Jesus, we have not only stopped being a disciple, but we have denied self. We've denied Jesus. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ is never easy, but it is meaningful and it is eternally rewarding. Not all the followers of Jesus were disciples or apostles. I'm thinking of Joseph of Arimathea. He's the one that gave Jesus the tomb. I'm thinking of the Marys that we talked about earlier this morning. There were a bunch of them and they, they followed Jesus all throughout his ministry and beyond. I'm thinking of the ways a follower of Jesus can be faithful. And there seems to be an unending list. I'm thinking of Simon of Cyrene. He was just in Jerusalem that day when the crowds built up to where you couldn't go forward or backward in the streets. And he couldn't figure it out because it wasn't rush hour. It wasn't time to go or leave work, but the crowds were there until he realized seeing a Roman centurion on a, centurion on a horse whipping three nearly naked men strapped to a crossbar, crossbar of, a, of a cross, a wooden cross. And those weighed about 100 pounds, nearly as much as the three men that were carrying them. And they were being beaten as they fell. Then one went down. Whipped while he was on the ground. And I'm thinking Simon must have been thinking something like, I'm glad that's not me. And suddenly it was. Jesus was the mentor. He will lead if we follow. And all the children say, Amen. Amen.